Hey guys, welcome to Hatch. I'm going to be introducing our first speaker, Dave Troy. Um, Dave Troy is a serial entrepreneur and activist based in Baltimore. He is a graduate of the Johns Hopkins University Department of Computer Science and became involved in entrepreneurship when he started his first company as a teenager. Today, he will be discussing aspects of his entrepreneurial journey and why getting involved in entrepreneurship at a young age is critically important. Please welcome Dave Troy. Thank you very much. Um, I want to make sure this mic is actually on. Here we go. Okay, so um, I want to thank uh, Lyle and um, the rest of the uh, gang here for putting this together and for inviting me to be here with you today. Um, so uh, first, just a little disclaimer. I just got in from Europe last night, and so I'm a little bit jet lagged right now. So it's about six hours later where my brain is. So just. It's, it's going to be sort of an interesting pace, but this should be okay. So, um, you know, one of the things that I think you'll find when you attend conferences on business and entrepreneurship is that um, there's kind of a uh, persistent focus on what I would call survivorship bias. Um, they tend to put people on stage and, you know, who have been very successful, um, and, uh, you know, you'll be hearing their stories and whatnot, and you kind of realize that, in fact, these people were not only very successful and made some interesting, probably some very good choices, but they're also very lucky. And, uh, you know, I think it's a little bit of a disservice to kind of uh, portray entrepreneurship as something that uh, is always going to lead to, like, wild success or whatever. Um, I think it's much more of a process and a way of thinking. And what I hope to convey to you today is some sense of what an entrepreneurial journey looks like, in my own case, and maybe some of the other ones that I've touched, um, and kind of how it's more of a thought process. This isn't about being, um, you know, sort of figuring out how to be ultimately wildly successful. It's about how to approach the world, right? And I can say this with some confidence because I'm only moderately successful, so therefore you can take what I say seriously. This is not all just luck talking, okay? <laughs> so... Um, just a little bit of background. Um, I started my first uh, company. Actually, the first entrepreneurial endeavor that I had was when I was about five years old. My family had just moved to Maryland from California, um, and uh, my parents had given me a big stack of papers to play with and said, you can do whatever you want with these. So I started to make paper airplanes and sell them around the neighborhood, selling them out of a trash bag and selling the small ones for five cents, bigger medium ones for 10 cents, and the larger ones for 25 cents. And uh, one of the neighbors called up and said, you know, to my parents, hey, listen, are you aware that your son is out selling your mortgage papers? <laughs> and, you know, this was like they had all this complicated stuff going on with their mortgage and escrow, and they had given me these extra, you know, papers and whatnot to play with, figuring I would draw on them or something. You know, they didn't know that I would be taking them out and selling them around the neighborhood. So, you know, this mindset kind of thing tends to start pretty young. And uh, by the time I was um, uh, 13, 14, I had my own software company and had done a bunch of things involving computer BBSs and things like that, which was kind of the precursor to the internet. But by the time I was 14, I had um, a company selling computer hardware and software uh, located here in Severna Park, Maryland, so just you know, 25 miles away or so from here. Um, and um, you know, by the time I was 16 and a junior in high school, I had my own storefront and was selling things and was you know, shipping things all around the world. And, by the time I graduated from uh, high school, myself and a partner, we had um, an annual business of about a million dollars a year of, you know, hardware and software. So then you're faced with this kind of choice of like, well, you know, what do I do? You know, do I do my own business stuff or do I go to college or whatever? And, of course, being 18 and, uh, you know, endlessly optimistic, I said, well, I can do both, of course. So I went to Johns Hopkins um, and uh, ran my business while I was attending Johns Hopkins. And... Uh, you know, that turned out to be very, very difficult to do, as many of you can probably imagine. The course load here is uh, intense, as you well know, um, and especially, you know, being a freshman, sophomore, uh, studying things. I, you, you mentioned that I, I, you know, graduated from the computer science department. I actually did not graduate from the computer science department, and I'll tell you the whole story about how that happened, but I did take a lot of comp sci classes and uh, learned a lot uh, that would prove to be foundational for a lot of the things that I've done later on. But, um, you know, I actually kind of skipped around between several different things. I, I was, for a little while, uh, majoring in behavioral biology and cognitive science, uh, comp sci, um, and ultimately liberal arts. Um, 
But, uh, you know, for me, it was really a question of, like, how do I balance this kind of entrepreneurial journey with uh, school? So uh, after, I think, a year and a half or so, uh, I decided to take some time off of school, focus on business, uh, getting that ramped up. So I started, um, you know, ramping up that business and developing uh, more distribution, and I was importing and exporting things to Europe and Asia and whatnot. And of course, this was still very much the time when being involved with technology was kind of all about selling and, you know, sort of developing physical products that you were shipping. So whether it was like shipping software packages or you know, computer hardware or whatever, you know, we, we had no longer, we had not yet entered into the, the age of the internet. So, um, around 1994, uh, the internet started to become kind of accessible as a, you know, commercializable technology. So I was immediately on that and developed our own software for doing sales online of, of computer hardware and software. So, uh, as part of that, um, we developed our own hosting capacity and things like that. And so, you know, we were able to start actually selling internet access um, in late 94, early 95. And um, that, of course, was, you know, very early days for the internet. And uh, we built that business up, ultimately got out of the business of um, selling uh, computers and software and stuff, and focused solely on internet access and web hosting and things like that. And uh, around 1997, I co-founded a small telephone company with some people in order to take advantage of economics associated with the Telecom Act of 1996. Um, I got married in 1992. I graduated from Hopkins in 1996. That took seven years because I started in 89 and graduated in 96. And as I mentioned, I ultimately graduated with a liberal arts degree. Now, if you've heard Steve Jobs talk about, you know, what has led to Apple's successes over the years, he's often said, and you know, before his death, that um, it was really about being at the intersection of technology and liberal arts. And I really believe that. And I think that one of the things that's incumbent on us as we start to educate you know, further generations and get people really wrapped around the challenges that are coming our way, which are significant, uh, is to get people um, focused on how do we integrate um, really the great lessons of liberal arts, which include you know, uh, architecture and art and literature and what it means to be human and philosophy and particularly ethics. Ethics are a key thing that we're missing right now, especially as we start to apply artificial intelligence and machine learning to this world around us. How do we do that ethically? And I would argue that most of the technology leaders that are in the space today have zero to, you know, very little foundation in ethics as they do these things. And we've seen that come out in the struggles around fake news and all the things going on politically with Facebook and things like that. So a piece of advice might be to focus some on uh, ethics as you uh, kind of pursue also understanding technology more deeply. Um, so uh, as a result of, uh, you know, building up that business that I had uh, in the you know, late 90s and up through like 2004, I basically built that up into a, you know, pretty successful company. I was the only uh, stockholder uh, my wife and I, uh, and uh, I did not raise any money around that business, and we sold it uh, in an all-cash deal in 2004. Um, now, you know, not a huge thing, but big enough to be very meaningful to me personally, which then has allowed me to go on to explore some other things. So in 2005 and 6, I worked uh, in Europe and in South America on developing voice over IP technologies. Got to spend a lot of time in Rio de Janeiro. That was cool. Um, and then also doing some work in Europe. But ultimately, I kind of realized that a, I was not really all that into telephony, because I really hate talking to people on the phone, and it kind of dawned on me, why am I working on building all this, you know, telephone stuff? When I, I knew a lot about it, but I didn't really like doing it, so uh, I decided to um, start looking at some other projects, and so in 2007, uh, I did a project just as kind of a weekend interesting little hack project uh, that was actually the first um, project to use the Twitter API. Um, so basically, it was a real-time visualization of all of the traffic on Twitter. Um, and that project went crazy viral, got all kinds of press coverage, led to a couple of other follow-on projects, and ultimately ended up in the Museum of Modern Art in New York for an exhibition there in 2008. And that kind of surprised me, because it made me realize that, like, if you follow something that's just sort of personally interesting, scratching an itch, and with the power of the internet, you know, you have this opportunity to reach everybody, right? And if you get the timing right and you get the kind of vibe of it right, that can become really, really a significant force. So that, in turn, put me in touch with the founders of Twitter, 
as well as a variety of other entrepreneurs, people like um, Stuart uh, Butterfield, the founder of Slack, and a, and a variety of people kind of from that generation who I've you know, now gone on to be part of my network. And um, as a result, uh, has led me into some other opportunities uh, like with 500 startups. So I'm a small investor in 500 startups. I just spent, uh, the, right before I was in Europe, I spent three weeks in Africa with 500 startups on a project, program called Geeks on a Plane where we went to Nigeria, um, to uh, Ghana, and to South Africa, talking to the entrepreneurial communities in each of those countries and studying what's happening there. Um, and then also, um, uh, as part of that, I got connected into TED and uh, TEDx community. So I started TEDx Mid-Atlantic in Washington, D.C., which has in turn connected me to a whole ton of other resources. And then in 2014, I did a TED Talk on mapping social networks, which I basically was one of the first people to start to look at large-scale um, understanding of social networks for understanding cities better and that sort of thing. So I'll talk a little bit more about that. But um, basically, uh, Getting involved with that it led me to other opportunities, uh, working with MIT on some projects in India. Um, and uh, ultimately, just this last week, I um, advise, am advising a company called Leaders, uh, which is uh, sort of based in San Francisco, but it started by a guy from France. And he was doing a conference in Paris. His object is to try to find um, the next emerging leaders around the world. He kind of describes it as a combination of product hunt for people uh, combined with the top 1% of LinkedIn. Uh, so what I would just sort of describe there is that that's sort of a, a story arc, right? There's sort of a progression of like one thing to the next. And I don't really know where it's going, and I don't necessarily have any specific goal in mind as I'm kind of pursuing these opportunities. But each new connection, each new phase kind of leads to more connections and bigger questions and more opportunities. So. I have a company right now called 410 Labs. Uh, we make products um, uh, that help people process email. But basically, the, the point of the company was to just try product ideas and see what works. And the ones that work, we keep, right? So we have a product called Maelstrom uh, for the web, uh, M-A-I-L-S-T-R-O-M, that helps people process email more efficiently. And that's a paid subscription project product. And then we have... Um, a product for iOS called Chuck that you can download right now that is free and lets you process email much, much more efficiently than anything else out there. So in addition to that, as, as if there's time to do more, but I don't watch a lot of TV, so I can fit a few more things in. Um, I'm doing some activism here in Baltimore. So uh, one of the things that I noticed was going on in the 2008, 2009 timeframe was that there was a lot of activity around entrepreneurship and startups and stuff in other cities that I was seeing, but not necessarily that much happening here in Baltimore. So I started to work more uh, concertedly on that, along with several other people, and started the first co-working space in Baltimore back in 2009. Um, and you know, if you've noticed, there's now a lot of co-working spaces, not only here in Baltimore, but around the world, and it's become kind of a thing. But you know, there, it was sort of a beginning to that, and I got plugged in with the people who were doing that and learned how to do it and got that set up uh, early. And that, in turn, led to the formation of startups and things like that. Um, and then I also started the um, Baltimore Angels Investment Group back in 2009, along with Greg Cangiolosi here in town. And um, that has now you know, done very, very well and has, I think, 50-some members and has invested in dozens of companies and has really helped to, help to become a sort of cornerstone of the Baltimore uh, startup and investment scene. And I've invested in some other companies my, myself along the way as well. Um, and, you know, again, it's this idea of kind of things moving forward. You know, there's always kind of a new opportunity and a new thing to get involved in. And you'll kind of see where it, it you know, ends up when you get there. But I wanted to kind of come back to a few key points along the way and maybe offer some specific um, ideas about how to think about an entrepreneurial journey and the one that you're going to create for yourselves. First is starting young is really, really awesome. Um, and the reason for that is because your costs are subsidized by your family, right? <laughs> you know, being able to at least sometimes live at home and not have a whole lot of other expenses going on is great. And, you know, I, I was speaking at a, uh, a high school, actually, in Latvia uh, a few weeks ago. And, you know, the thing I was telling them, even at that age, you know, it's amazing to be able to get started with something because you really just don't have any expenses. So by the time you get to college and whatnot, yeah, your expenses start to go up a little bit. But 
you know, you don't have necessarily like a mortgage, you don't have, you know, car payments, you don't have kids to deal with, you don't have all these other things that, uh, you know, potentially are, are going to be just continuous drags on you. And I think one of the things that I've noticed here in, the, in this market um, in terms of entrepreneurship is that if you get a good degree like in computer science or something like that and then you get a security clearance, you can get a job you know, making 150K, uh, you know, here locally with NSA or some contractor that works for them. And that's great. But then you start to get kind of addicted to the cash flow, right? <laughs> and, you know, you start to buy things and you start to have, you know, a wife and kids or whatever, and it just starts to get to be something you can't walk away from, right? So I think being able to kind of just go into entrepreneurship and not worry so much about the downside, because everybody talks about the risk or whatever. I don't think the risk is that high, but don't make extra risk for yourself, right? If you can avoid it, like try to keep the risk down to a dull roar. So anyway, starting young um, is a really, really great thing to do, because you're also very, you know, you're kind of like stem cells, you know, you're very plastic. You can kind of like reform yourselves into a lot of different shapes and sizes and plug into things. And, you know, so you're, you're very malleable at that age and able to kind of try different things and not worry so much about the consequences. I think when people get into their later 20s and 30s and 40s, it becomes much more difficult to say, I was doing this, but now I'm going to jump away and do this. It's just psychologically very difficult. So that's one thing. The other thing I wanted to kind of point out um, is an insight that I gained from the work of a woman named Sarah Sarasvati who um, is a researcher around the topic of entrepreneurship. And this, there's a paper that I would recommend that you look up of hers. It's called, What Makes Entrepreneurs Entrepreneurial? And in that paper, um, she outlines basically two modes of thinking, two different ways of kind of seeing the world. The first is what she describes as effectual logic. And she believes that this is the mode of thinking that entrepreneurs employ. Um, when they kind of perceive the world and how to create change in the world. And, and in effectual logic, what she argues is that people start with kind of what they have and what they know. So you might know a few people. You might have a really good subject matter expertise in a particular area. You might have a patent. You might have a physical location where you can try something. You might have a pile of mortgage papers that you can turn into paper airplanes, <laughs> whatever it might be. And um, you start with that, and you sort of create something. You add value to that, and then you put that out in the world, and you see kind of if, if the world responds to it. If the world responds to it uh, in a positive way, you'll probably generate some profits, which can then be used to put back in. And you might make some new contacts, which can then be folded back in, and you can kind of take, keep iterating on that until eventually you've kind of built up enough stuff to kind of be able to do something really pretty special because you now have all of these contacts and capital and things that have been added to the mix. But what she argues is that at each stage of that process, you're placing bets, but they're very specifically structured kind of bets. So you're basically creating bets that have um, sort of unlimited or unknown upsides and very small or capped downsides. So never make a huge bet that's going to totally, you know, blow you up unless you're just so sure about it and you're willing to kind of go do that, go there. But almost all the bets that entrepreneurs make are small controlled bets where the upside is greater than the downside. And if you think about how markets work and how the world kind of is structured, you know, it's a huge market. If you do something really good, your upside is going to be very significant. So I think that's sort of one interesting thing to keep in mind about this idea of effectual logic. The other piece of it is that it means that entrepreneurs in general tend to be much better at starting things and kind of like innovating and moving things forward than they are at running things. And so we often hear, think about the idea of like a great CEO. Well, a great CEO is actually an amalgam of two different really distinct skill sets. The first being this effectual logic sometimes to be able to bring something to fruition. But then there's also what Sarasvati describes as causal logic. And this is the kind of logic that an executive might employ when you're trying to get market share from one company to another. So like if you're the CEO of Coke, you're going to employ you know, a really good ad campaign that's going to get you a percent market share away from Pepsi. right? And that's a totally different kind of thinking than what most entrepreneurs actually do. And I think that's one, reasons why, one of the reasons why many CEOs uh, many founding CEOs um, are really bad operators. So I think one of the things that you should be thinking about as you get on your entrepreneurial journey is what kind of business person are you really, you know, yourself best suited to be? 
Are you more of an entrepreneur and an effectual thinking kind of person? Are you kind of good at thinking on your feet and maybe BSing a little and going along? Or are you the kind of person that's going to be able to inspire the confidence of a board of directors and you know, maybe shareholders in order to get a market share away from Pepsi? And not that there's anything wrong with those two things, but they're very different. And if you look at even some of the most experienced uh, you know, business leaders and entrepreneurs, they've, they have not necessarily had the easiest time moving between those mo modes. And I would argue that um, Steve Jobs is a very good example of somebody who had to kind of go spend some time in the desert in order to figure out how to move between those two modes of being. And there are other examples that, you know, you could look at too, but it's another thing to think about. Um, on the topic of raising money, um, you know, I've both raised money and not raised money for stuff. And I think one of the things that's not great about our current entrepreneurship culture is that there has become kind of a orthodoxy to how you're supposed to do things, right? It's sort of like, you know, well, I'm getting my seed round and I'm, you know, getting angel investors and then I'm going to be looking to do a series A and then I'm going to do a series B and this is how it's going to be. Bottom line is that the world really seldom actually works that way. And in fact, I think it's a little bit of a disservice to assume that there's like one pathway. I think you know, there's an awful lot that you can do with bootstrapping. And the great thing about bootstrapping is that you're the only shareholder. And you, know, you don't have to listen to what anybody else thinks. And um, at the end of the day, also, raising money is its own full-time job. You know, it requires focus on that task alone. It requires going out and talking to a lot of people, a lot of bullshitting sometimes. <laughs> And um, you know, it is a, uh, it's almost antagonistic to whatever business task you're actually trying to perform because you know, it doesn't actually get you closer to customers. It doesn't actually get you closer to truth about the product. Um, so I would say approach that with some skepticism. But still, you know, there's no, nothing wrong at all with raising money if it's the right thing to do. Um, so you know, from this, I would argue that this idea of like effectual logic, the entrepreneurial mindset, is very much a way of, of kind of perceiving the world, um, that it's a problem-solving technique. So some people, you know, when they see a problem, you know, they think, oh, well, I'm going to go talk to the government, or I'm going to you know, see if I can get somebody else to solve it. An entrepreneur thinks, I'm going to solve it. <laughs> Here's what I'm going to do. This is an interesting problem, and these are the things that I can bring to bear. What do you know? How can you help me bring this to, to fruition? And then you kind of move it forward. So you, you know, I would say that a mark of a of a really good entrepreneur is somebody who kind of continuously sees the world as something that they can actually help to untangle and solve. And I would argue that it's worth kind of exploring how do you, you know, sort of sharpen your own skills for, for your capacity to do that. Um, and another interesting insight around sort of entrepreneurial thinking is uh, to listen to some of the stuff that Elon Musk has said. Um, and I, again, hesitate sometimes to point to the, like, the Steve Jobs and the Elon Musks of the world who have been super successful and are obviously exceptional. But I do think that his one insight around sort of product development um, is really key, which is to think about things in terms of first principles. And by first principles, I mean reducing stuff to like the laws of physics, right? So what, when he looked at you know, travel, uh, he saw you know, that uh, there was an opportunity to create a, you know, vacu evacuated tube with a vehicle with a fan on the front and accelerate it to 700 miles an hour and run it across the landscape. That's Hyperloop, right? And when he looked at SpaceX, he said, well, you know, clearly we could, if we, if we had a good enough computer control and the right rocket mechanisms and whatnot, we could build rockets that are reusable and could land and things like that. And he's really good at just kind of blocking out all the other thinking and all the other competitors and all the other noise that surrounds a problem and reducing it to the physics problem that underlies it. And I think that's a place that, you know, particularly Hopkins uh, is potentially really well suited to address is that because, you know, there is such an emphasis here on, uh, you know, science and math and, and first principles of physics, that's something that you can really dig into. So I think that's a great way to derive new ideas for products and it's something that, uh, you know, you all can pursue. So, you know, I, I, I don't want to take too much time here. A couple more minutes or like one or two more minutes? Okay, cool. So um, at any rate, uh, you know, giving you a little bit of an outline, I think, of some ideas that you can apply to thinking about the world entrepreneurially. Um, you know, I think um, an overarching uh, theme that I think is really worth kind of focusing on is to focus on working on things that actually matter to people as opposed to things where you think you can make money. 
because in the end, life is short, and it's probably worth focusing on the things that can actually make a real difference. And you know, in my own case, I've become more involved with Baltimore politics and activism here, trying to make a difference with that. And in really simple ways, I've got a Facebook group called Baltimore City Voters that I hope if all, any of you are voting in Baltimore City, please join. It's a great conversation on civics and whatnot. But things like that that can actually kind of start to slowly. And they're not always going to happen overnight. It's not always going to be flashy. I don't have an exit strategy with Baltimore City voters, you know. But it's the right thing to do, you know. And I think that there are dozens of things in the world where, you know, it's, it's kind of the right thing to do. And, and I think that those also lead to opportunities that can have entrepreneurial outcomes. So remember that, you know, the money is a side effect of creating value in the world. And your primary goal as an entrepreneur is to actually create real value in the world and to, to work on things that matter. So, um, you know, play that bigger game. Uh, we don't really have much time. And, uh, you know, contribute your skills, which I know are considerable, to problems that um, are really worthy of your time. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see you.